We are live. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Welcome to the Garden Show. I'm Peggy Ballister Hallows, and this is Kusa Dogwood, my um, my ready assistant in all things. And summer's kind of beginning to wind to an end, and um, that makes me mostly sad, but it's also sort of a relief because I could use a break. There's been a lot going on, and the end of summer is always marked by my birthday, which is this week, this Thursday, and couple weeks ago, we talked about the jujube tree, which we discovered, and it's here. So next week, we will uh, show you the planting of the jujube tree, and that should be fun. We have a spot picked out for it, and I intend to plant it actually on my birthday. That is the plan. But I have promised you that I will start the show every week with a tool, and as I fish around in my back pocket, there it is, there it is, this is a tool that is always in my back pocket. Do you like that tool? What? Yeah. Okay. This is a sharpening tool and it's not a stone. It is some kind of metal and it is covered in um, diamond dust and it has a really nice shape. So it's very convenient and you can get into all the nooks and crannies. And I'm going to show you a few, few pictures of things that, you know, might be helpful. So, I'm going to go to the pictures. Okay, so that's on the left are sharpening stones. And, and I have them and I have used them, um, but I use them more for my stone carving tools. And I also actually use them when I carve stone, which I haven't done in a while, but something I really enjoy doing um, for really smoothing out bumps on the stone. So I use them for multiple purposes, but I have used them to sharpen blades. Problem is if you put them in your pocket, they can break. And there are also ones that come in little wooden boxes that you, but they're not really adaptable to hand tools. So um, I have broken two of my stone carving, uh, stone carving sharpening tools. And so I decided I don't want to carry them around with me anymore. And then the one that I have was a gift from Jordan for Christmas last year. And it's perfect. It doesn't break. It fits conveniently in my pocket. It's flat enough that I don't even notice it's there when I'm sitting on it. I think it's gone through the wash a couple of times. I'm sorry. That's survived. It runs be uh, between $20 and $30 when you buy it separately, um, which is a fair amount of money. But if you look at the picture on the right, Gemplers offers it as part of the set. Now it's manufactured by Felco, which is a great tool company. And you can order it it comes with the pruners. Velcro pruners are good pruners, no question. Um, I don't think that they've come up with a ratcheting pruner yet, but I have Velcro pruners and they're very reliable. Uh, so that particular leather pouch that you can put on your belt also has a cute little pocket just for the sharpener. So you carry that with you. Um, there you see. And when you hold the particular pruners or other pruners or other tools, you can uh, sharpen it. They say to hold it at a 23 degree angle, uh, but the way it's shaped with the little tapers into the little point, which is not what the stone ones do, really makes it easy to get into the edges, you know, right up against the handle, which is not always so easy to access. So um, next. That's it. That's it. We're done with the pictures. So I have one. And as I said, I always recommend it and I always have it in my pocket. So it's not particularly expensive, very handy. But if you're ever out standing in the field and the blade's not cutting and you've been using it for a while, having it with you saves your trip back and makes the job a little bit easier. So again, a Felco diamond dusted 
sharpening tool. So there you go. All right. So now I want to talk about um, my husband's band a little bit. Oh, because you can't walk on the table. Sorry. Okay. So my husband's band is called JT Rocks. Can I hold this up? Can we be able to see it? Okay. This is Ken. Can you see that? Yeah, JT Rocks. And those of you that have come to the Plant Exchange have seen them play. And the reason I'm bringing them up is we were talking about the name. They changed it from JT Rocks, R-O-C-K-S, to R-O-X, which I guess they think is better. And we were having a discussion about band names. And he was explaining that lots of bands have discussions about the name of the band. Is that, that's correct, right? Yes. Okay. And they don't always agree. And they're, the name within the band is not necessarily the name of a person. It could just be a name. And some of the bands that are really not necessarily happy with their names, like Goo Goo Dolls, there's some controversy over that. And Foo Fighters, just a little controversy. And then Tommy pointed out that this band called Jethro Tull was named after a person in literature. Can, can we uh, have a little music, please? Well, there is music and uh, by Jethro Tull. And the reason that we bring this up is because Jethro Tull was not a person in literature, a person in history. And Jethro Tull is considered the father of modern agriculture. I don't know how he got picked to be the name of a rock band, but he did. And he invented the seed drill. Now, what the seed drill is, is a way of getting the seed through a hopper pulled by a horse, and it goes into a hopper down into like a chute, and then it gets in a little V-shaped applicator, I guess would be a good word, so that the seed drill can drop a straight row of seeds in the row that's been prepared. And uh, it, it was a way to, to plant more efficiently. And it was invented in 1701. And prior to all that, sowing seeds was done by hand and it was just scattering them on the ground. And, uh, and, that was considered very inefficient. So he came up with uh, this way that was much more uh, seed conserving and seed was kind of an expensive part. And it was the first agricultural machine that had moving parts. And it started as a one man, one row device, but later designed sowed seed in like up to three uniform rows. It had wheels and it was drawn by horses. So it was just a much more, uh, efficient system. And he went on to make other inventions down the road. His horse-drawn hoe came up, was for loosening up the soil. He thought that the soil was food for the plants, but it wasn't really, but it did aerate the soil. And he ended up being a very successful farmer. And somehow he also became the name of a rock band from when? The 70s? Was that you know, the 70s? All through the 70s maybe into the 80s. And uh, can we get their song on there? Do we have it now? This is a Jethro Tull song. Now we know that's not just the name of agricultural history. So you never know where you're going to learn something about farming, and it seems to be everywhere. So it, it, all walks of life are affected by what happens in agriculture. So I'm going to give you the phone number. It's 888 399 7344. 
That's 888-399-PEGI. That's my name, 7344. And we have no callers on the line at the moment. So if you call, we'll get you through very quickly. And I've also been asked to comment that there's little boxes on the bottom of the screen somewhere if you're watching. And if you click on like or subscribe, it supposedly helps the show. I'm not sure exactly how it helps the show, but eventually, apparently, if we get enough, um, it boosts us up in some monitoring world of how many likes and subscribes you get. And uh, so that could be very helpful. It's not like we're trying to make a lot of money here on The Garden Show, but um, we have run into some expenses and it would be nice if we could get enough so that at some point it just, uh, all the costs are covered. So we're gonna go to the phones now. And who are we gonna talk to? Let's see. Uh, Danny from Metuchen, is that is that who we're gonna to talk to? Having a little trouble. Um, hi, my name is Danny from Metuchen. Okay, Danny girl, where are you? Let's have a little chat. Uh, we're having minor technical difficulties. Apparently the buttons are not doing what they're supposed to do. Um, okay. We're standing by according to my, uh, producer over there. We're standing by. Okay. Well, I'm going to, um, keep talking and, uh, when we get it all figured out, we'll get back to the callers. Please don't go away, Danny. And then we have Mary Jane, which is really important because we have a whole bunch of slide shows that we want to talk about, including, including one all about Mary Jane's lilac. So we have Danny now. Okay. Danny girl. Good morning. Good morning, Peggy. How are you? Uh, well, I'm good. We seem to be having some technical difficulties, which is making me very nervous, but um, but we're good. So what can I do for you today? Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes. But I'd just like to point out to you when Tommy was playing the music. Yes. We couldn't hear. I couldn't hear it. Oh, okay. Oh, um, that's too um, yeah. bad. So that just, was a really know. good song. I was dancing. Did you see me yes. dancing? Okay. <laughs> well, then that was I saw the, you dancing. That was the important part, you know, watching me dance. That was the important part. Okay. Well, we'll our buttons are like not cooperating today as much as they we would like. But I, I can point out that here, here are my hands. Can you see that? They're they're not fading as they go out. They're still there. Um, I found um, a couple weeks ago at the Ocean Grove house, I had to replace a blanket. I noticed a big tear in the corner and I don't even know how it got there. And so I quick stitched it up and tucked it in the corner so no one would see it. And then immediately went online and replaced it. Guess what color it was, Danny? What color? Yes, it was green. Blue? Green, no, green. it was green. This big, giant, fuzzy, green blanket. So it is now hanging on the wall behind me. It is my green screen. So that. Oh. Yes. So that's why, you know, um, we were going to try to order one. It was a couple hundred bucks or so. And then I said, oh, my, I have this blanket that I didn't know what to do with. It's a really nice fuzzy blanket, but I can't use it anymore because I've got a tear in the corner. And so I just folded it up and I put it in the basement in Ocean Grove. And there it was at just last week. And so I brought it and now it's hanging behind me. So now I'm all in the picture. Isn't that cool? Awesome. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. I, right now I can't see it because I have to be away from my yes, computer. Yes, so but you will, you. you will see but. that I'm not fading in and out. And do you know why they use green? Uh, well, I didn't know any of this. I mean, we're all learning. Because green is the furthest from human skin tones. And that's how the cameras can differentiate. I thought that was kind of interesting. Wow. Yeah. And blue yeah. is next. We're learning something new every day, uh, right? Every day. Doesn't matter what topic. Yes. Yeah. So we're learning something new. So um, so things are some things are getting better. So what can I what can I do for you? Okay. So within the last two weeks. I had two people offer me their wonderful heirloom tomato seed. The first one, I really did not have. I wasn't prepared. I was like, no, 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 no. If you have the seed saved, when I see you later on or early next year, I will get some seeds from you. 
Then I was offered another one. It was a beautiful, um, like a golden yellow, orangish um, heirloom tomato. And the person actually said, take this tomato. You know, I have one at their place. And, and they said, take this tomato. You can go home and save this seed. So I'm like, I went online and started Googling. Because according to what they this person told me, you just have to take the seeds out and plop them onto two layers of, in between two layers of paper towels. And then let it dry for a few days and then you scrape it off and then do them again repeatedly until it completely dries. But when I went online, first of all, they say you have to soak it, you have to ferment it and this and that. And I'm like, do I really need to go through all this? I don't remember hearing people talk about it. I guess maybe for the for commercial production, they want to be have higher, um, uh, what you might call it, um, propagation rate. So they do that. And and then I saw another one says you wash them and you, or you peel off the membrane covering the coating the seeds, and then you you know keep them dry. So I, I finally thought about it. Why do I call Peggy? And then that way she can share it with everybody. Okay. When she explained it to me. I'm glad that I'm glad that you did because I don't know about fermenting. That sounds really weird. But the first thing I'm going to tell you is, if it were me, I would not eat that tomato. I would not try to eat the tomato. I would never eat that tomato. I would put it on a windowsill until it starts to rot. Because you want okay. the seed inside the tomato to be as mature as possible. And if you harvest it when it's still pristine, I think you're going to get a lower viability of the seed. You want the seed to really ripen and fully mature. So just leave the tomato. I okay. put it on a plate or something because, you know, it's going to get gooey, but you really want it to right. be as mature as possible. When you think about, you know, if it was outside and when you have them come up in the compost pile and they come up in the compost pile with gusto, it's because you've thrown them out there and they've completely rotted out there. Right. So, so that's what you want to do. Makes sense. Yeah. Right. So you want them right. to, you want the fruit to have every opportunity of maturing completely. And then you take out all the seeds and yes, you wash them and you wash them for two reasons. You want to get all the goo off and yes, the membrane will, will wash off. You want to get all that off. But here's the other thing. You don't want to save the floaters. The ones that float are okay. probably not viable. So you wash okay. them thoroughly, you scoop out the floaters, and you save the ones that sink. And then, yes, you dry them on a paper towel and you pat them dry and okay. you let them stay dry for, you know, a few days. And then you scrape them into an envelope. If you remember, you probably don't, but you may. Last year, I asked for bank envelopes, the little coin envelopes that you Many, many mm -hmm. years ago, people would get their pay checks in every white week when they went up to get paid. It would come in a little brown envelope. Well, my daughter found right. them for me in purple for my birthday, which was, you know, very special. And those are great because they're not too big. They're just the right size. You can scoop the seeds in. You can write on the envelope as to what they are. And then you stick them in a jar in the refrigerator. And you can stick lots of these envelopes in the jar in the refrigerator. So if you're saving other seeds, you can have them easily marked and you keep them in a refrigerator. And if if you have okay. one of those little packets that that come in things that like a silicone packet that, you know, absorbs mm -hmm. moisture, you can throw one of those in there, too. So it doesn't okay. things don't rot. Okay. But. I think it's far more important to let the fruit completely rot than to do any of those other shenanigans. So just let it rot, save the seed, wash it, get rid of the floaters, let them dry and, and keep them refrigerated till next year. You should be good. Okay. Sounds good. Like I said, now I just have to look at this beautiful tomato and let it sit there. Rot. I'm okay. sorry. Never mind. I will, I will ask my friend for more. <laughs> uh, really? If you want the seed, that's the way to go. Okay. Sounds good. I, I get to say, I just, I never done it. And uh, I remember Dave's father always had these seeds laying on a um, brown paper bag. No, that brown Drying paper them. bag is just as good as um, a paper towel. Paper towel. And for a long time. Right. And they probably don't stick, right? They, they might not stick to a brown paper bag. That's right. But for how many years right. did brown paper bags disappear? 
people used to call brown bagging your lunch. Nobody did that anymore. No one had right. brown paper bags. They were gone. Everyone was using plastic. But now, brown paper bags are back. They're coming back. Yes. yes. So yes. if you have yes. a brown paper bag, that would work. If you don't use a paper towel, uh, you could probably even use a a piece of computer paper that you're about to throw away. You know, something that you know mm -hmm. that it will mm -hmm. dry on. But that's the idea. The paper towel is more water absorbing than the other things but absorbing right but right you know, they'll, so they'll, after you know in the process yeah they will work they will work right okay are we good okay all yes. right and you're thank you very much now right. everybody will know how to how to do this properly. yes absolutely and you're you're going away but you're coming back and then uh what was that okay we don't know what that was okay so you're going away and you're coming back and then we're going to go to the edison uh flower and plant shop right so maybe yeah so you need to let me know tentative what day so when i come back and then i will you know go visit her and work out or make arrangements i'm thinking of Ooh. the week after labor day you know that week where labor day is on monday that week sometime that week will you be back by then yes i'll be back okay and, and we'll uh, pick a day that week that'll yeah. be good okay okay have a good trip wherever you're going and we'll talk to you soon okay Okay, thank you very much. Thanks Have a great long. day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, so now we're going to go to Mary Jane. Is that correct? Can we have... Uh, all right, let's talk to Mary Jane first. Good morning, Mary Jane. How are you? Hi, Hi Peggy. I'm fine. How are you? I think I'm really good. It's my birthday week, and we started last night. You yeah. know, we went out for... Well, happy birthday. Thank again. you. We went, we, went, uh, we went for ice cream, and I got a large... I got a large cherry vanilla with caramel <laughs> sauce and wet walnuts and whipped cream and a cherry. And I ate the whole thing. <laughs> it was very bad. delicious. It was really good. It was really good. so that <laughs> so that was fun. Okay, so uh, I don't indulge that much very often, but it is my beginning of my birthday week, so I felt it was legitimate. So you're entitled. Thank you. Thank sure. you. So you sent me great pictures. Okay, let's bring up those pictures. That poor lilac, it's not looking too good. Yeah. Um, but um, and and as a result of our conversation uh, last week, someone else sent me pictures. So I have two sets of pictures for us to look at. And you can see that uh, all the edges of the leaves are brown and a lot of leaves have fallen off. And I would definitely be very careful with whatever you remove, whatever foliage you rake up, please bag it up and get rid of it. Um, you don't want it hanging around. But uh, let's look at the next picture. Okay, um, but you can see, picture on the left in the screen, you can see that the main vein still looks pretty green. Can you see that, Mary Jane? Yes, yes. Okay, that's, that's kind of important. Um, and I'm going to have to tell you that there's no way to be absolutely certain what this disease is without taking it to a laboratory and having it cultured. And okay. you see, the reason that the vein thing is so important is, um, no, back up, back up, back up. Okay. Oh, one more. Yeah, that one. If you see um, the veins on the leaves, it's black all the way back to the stem. And you can see that it kind of goes from the foliage to the main vein to the tip of the plant, and then it travels down. Yours didn't do that. Yours didn't do that. And those, okay. um, and that is uh, the disease classically shows up in the spring on new growth. Um, so it goes from the tips back, as opposed to, Tommy, can we go back to the previous slide? Yeah, as opposed to it, the veins being okay, there's no tipping at the tip of the branches. It's called a uh, shepherd hook, and there's no, none mm -hmm. of that. So, okay, so we're going to slide forward a couple of pictures now. So if you really want to get it absolutely identified, then you can go to the plant diagnostic lab, lab Mm -hmm. laboratory, sorry, uh, which is part of Rutgers. And I'm going to make a quick side comment. Mm -hmm. It's located at 20 Endike Engle Way. Dr. Henry Endike, 
was a, a very dear friend of mine and he was a turf grass specialist and I did not know they named the street after him. And Dr. Engel was another turf grass specialist. I was not as close to him, but Dr. M. Dyke was a, a dear friend. So I got a kick out of it. Just looking this up may put a smile on my face, but you can call them. The contact information is on the screen. You can send them a sample. I'm sure there's a charge for it if you really want to know. And, and that's, you know, At knowing- this point, I've, I've pretty much thrown everything away. I've cut it all. I cut all the plant, all the leaves off and, and did discard them. Okay. And when you were making your cuts, were you careful to dip your pruners in a 10% solution of bleach so you didn't spread the disease? I, I did. I did do that. Yes. I oh. read that online and I did oh. do that. I'm so glad. That's great. Okay. So here's what the other lady um i don't remember who who it was now um don't remember the name uh, forgive me for that um but that's a picture of her lilac in the spring mm. did yours look something like that in the spring nice and full and green and round actually yes yes in the spring it was nice it, it bloomed beautifully and you know after they after it finished blooming i do as i do every year i, I cut off all the spent blossoms and it was still looking fine, probably up until maybe four to six weeks ago, top. Okay. All right. So I'm going to point out that, that this picture, which is a great picture and the plant looks nice and healthy, but it does look a little crowded and hers has been in the ground for a long time and yours has been in the ground for a long time. I don't have a picture of yours when it was looking good, but I would have to say mm -hmm. that this one looks like it's very round. You know what I'm saying? It's very round. I'm wondering if it was sheared at any point, which is not a good idea with lilacs. And um, and it one of the things I would recommend is opening that up and getting better air circulation in it is helpful. And it's obviously grown into what's growing around it. I don't know if yours has gotten crowded. Is there anything growing around yours in a similar way? There's really, there's really not, and I never, I never shear it. I always do it by hand. Good for you. Okay. So that is not your problem, but it may be contributing to um, this problem. But um, one of the things that was pointed out to me by my dear friend, Jack Otterbein, was that all of a sudden the grass is growing like crazy and there's a tremendous amount of moisture and the air has been so humid. It's so thick. You can practically choke on it. It's so wet and heavy. Have you noticed that? Yes. 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 I hate humidity. So yes, yes, I definitely noticed it. <laughs> yes. So that is very conducive to fungus diseases. And the fact that mm -hmm. both you and our other um, viewer has experienced the same thing at the same time. And I have not seen, um, uh, I have not seen any of the shepherd hooking or the brown stems at the tip makes me think that it's not the bacterial disease. Uh, there's no, you know, there's okay. no guarantee, but it is the fungus disease. Right. So very, very important to, right. you know, rake everything up. And if there, if it is the bacterial disease, um, <laughs> there really isn't anything you can do about it. There's very little control. It may come back. You can prune it off. You can keep the pruners clean. But it, there's really, in the spring, you can spray with a copper sulfate. And I'm going to talk about copper sulfate. I was looking up, you know, what can you do? What can you do? And copper sulfate is, first of all, it's very confusing. You can buy it locally. It's available to homeowners. It's, here's where it gets really confusing. Copper sulfate is listed as an inorganic compound, meaning that it is not carbon based. You know, organic chemistry is based significantly on, on the, the carbon. And so it's considered an inorganic chemical, but it is organic in the sense that it can be used by organic growers. And that's one of the pet peeves I have that the word organic has too many meanings and it's very confusing. So if you see it and you choose to use it in the spring and spray it on in the spring, that copper sulfate, it may say inorganic, but it is considered organic in the terms of organic growing. Did that, did I make that clear? Because it still confuses me. Did I make that clear? It, it is confusing. Yeah, it is confusing, but I think I understand you. Okay. All right. So you can find it 
and you can spray it. Now, if your is your lilac as big as the one in this picture, or was it as big as the one in this picture? It's not 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 as tall because I, I usually, like I said, it was probably well maybe eight to ten feet tall. Okay, so um, the the biggest problem that you're going to have is reaching the top and spraying it, you know, to make sure you get good coverage. Um, so. They're really, again, there's very little that you can do if it's the bacterial disease. So you can also keep an eye on it and you can spray it with a fungicide later, you know, in the summer, you know, when the humidity goes up, if you want to treat it as if it was a fungal disease, which we're hoping that's what hmm. it is, because if it's a fungus disease, it, it will probably come back next year because the foliage didn't drop off okay. until August. So it had this whole right. spring season of, you know, doing the photosynthesis thing, which is the important thing that plants do to store energy so that they can store it in the roots and then come back the following year. So it's not like it happened in May or June. It happened in August. So it's not good, but it's not necessarily getting defoliated at this time of year is not necessarily deadly. Um, and pruning it back, I would suggest, because it was defoliated and was weakened, I would suggest a significant shaping and pruning and taking out some of the oldest growth, the oldest wood down at the base, uh, because that's not, that doesn't flower anyway. And you want to save some of the moderate middle aged kind of growth and some of the new shoots, but you want to open it up so it has better air circulation within the plant. And I, and I think that's the best you can do, but I'm not convinced it's going to die. Okay, well, that's good news. Should I should I be mulching it now or doing anything? Should I fertilize it in the spring? Um, you could give it a light dose of fertilizer in the spring. Lilacs are not heavy feeders, so you don't need, but just a little bit mm -hmm. to offset the fact that it lost all its leaves would probably be a good idea, especially if you haven't fertilized it in the past. Um, just a little bit to give it a boost, but um, you won't really know for sure how it's doing until you see how it comes out in the spring. But keep a close eye because if you start to get a fungus disease, again, you're going to want to treat it with a fungicide before it takes over the plant. Okay. And it, is the copper sulfate applied before it blooms? Yes. It's applied, you know, very early spring. Okay. And, and I'm sorry, should I mulch it now? Did you say I should mulch it? Well, Put anything around it? No. Any protection for the winter? Well, not yet. I mean, I don't know that you need it yet. Um, you could mulch, okay. you know, help keep keep weeds down. Mulch is also used to um, retain soil moisture, which at the moment is not absolutely necessary. Uh, there's plenty of soil moisture, but you know, mulching is always a good idea and mulching it for the winter is also a really good idea. I, I don't need, I don't know that you need to run out and do that this afternoon. You could, but okay. it's not okay. necessary. It's still only August. I think you have until pretty much like the middle of October before you need to do that. Yeah. You want to protect it for the okay. winter, of so course, but but uh, if it makes you feel better, so keep that my you're fingers crossed that. It, yes, <laughs> I know, I know. Keep my fingers crossed that it may come back. Yes, yes, it may survive. But you have to promise me one thing. Yes. If, if it comes back in the spring, you'll let me know so we can celebrate. Okay, because you know, <laughs> I know, okay. I know how. I'll send, attached, you, I'll send you a picture of it at yes, that time. Yes, I know how attached people get to things, trees in the yard that they've had a really long time. Uh, I yeah, I have a couple yeah. of. Um, House plants. Then we were completely overhauling the greenhouse this week. Oh, it, Mary Jane, it was huge. We took out almost every plant out of that greenhouse, and you've seen the greenhouse. It it mm. took me two days to yeah. get everything out of there. You know, you had to find a good spot. Mm. It didn't couldn't be in too much sun because it would burn. And I had to put some on the other side of the greenhouse, which isn't really a greenhouse anymore. It's just a sitting area. And, and of course, everything had to be cleaned, and the tables had to be scrubbed. It, it was this huge job. But I came across some plants that have been there for such a long time and they're so amazing. And if I lost any one of them, I would cry. So you get attached, <laughs> you know, they, they kind of mark. The I, I actually was, yeah, I, I was tearing up when I was pruning it because it's, it's, yeah, it's just been there forever and it's so, it's dependable every year. And like you said, I don't really do anything to it. It's just, it's there, you know, it's so a friend. It's, it was, it's been very, it was a friend. Yeah, it is. It I, is. I it totally is. get it. Maybe not the whole rest of the world gets yeah. it, but I bet all the people listening to this show <laughs> get it because, yeah, you get attached. <laughs> yeah. You totally get attached. Okay. So keep me posted. And if you really want to go over to the, the diagnostic lab and they can tell you, but even if it turns out to be the disease, there isn't anything you can do about it. So 
seems mm -hmm. kind of pointless to spend the money. Okay. But sometimes you just want to know. So if that's the case, you can reach right, out to them. Right. And and they're uh, it's a, a great service that they provide. So if you want to do that. Um, oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, good luck and keep me posted. Okay. okay? Good to know. Thanks so much, Peggy. I appreciate it. My have, pleasure. have a happy birthday. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Bye-bye now. Okay. Bye now. Okay. So I'm going to do something totally not garden related. Okay. But we do food sometimes. So, so do, do you know what this is? This is a glass of milk. Okay. All right. So here we go. All right. Oh, this is heavy. All right. I'm going to lift this up. Hopefully I won't spill the milk all over the place. Okay. These are Oreo cookies. These are all kinds of weird Oreo cookies. And they advertise Oreo as milk's favorite cookie. And I'm inclined to agree. We're big Oreo fans here. And, uh, but you go to the store now, and it's not just Oreo. And I have a personal attachment to Oreos because I knew this man who called himself Mr. Oreo. And as part of my career um, along the way, I was the compost queen and I traveled all around the country going to my, my employer was located in Iowa. So I'd fly into Chicago and then take a puddle jumper to where he was. And then, uh, but I would also fly into Chicago as a hub and fly to all different parts of the country to visit compost sites. And yes, I had seen the country uh, compost sites are often located next door to landfill. So I have seen, probably 35 of the states by one landfill after another. Um, but on the flight home on Friday, because I almost always took the same flight home on Friday. It wasn't every week, but I was on the road probably every other week, every third week. And I always took the same flight home. And this gentleman who called himself Mr. Oreo, who was very old at the time, um, was always there. I always sat with him. And he used to give me coupons for free Oreos. And he told me a story that he had invented a different white filler cream and that all the taste tests said that it was better, but the company voted not to use the new improved white filling because of basically what happened to Coca-Cola <laughs> when they introduced the new Coke and it was a total bust. And then they went to classic Coke and then classic Coke kind of disappeared. And now it's back to just being Coke. So they decided not to mess with the number one biggest selling cookie in the world. And they left it the way it was. So the Oreos that we know and love have been around since the early 1900s and they are very popular and very good. But now there's all these other ones. So here's what we did. We did a taste test and we have all of these Oreos and there's many more in China they have a peach flavored Oreo, which I don't know that you can get it here, but all right. So we did, what we did was we took all these Oreos and we put a piece of paper on each one and everyone at the table got to vote on a scale of one to 10, which Oreo, what, what they thought of each Oreo. So the first one, the one that came out the worst is Oreo thins. And I'm going to have to say, what's the point? That one came up as 3.3 .3 out of 10 as an average. This other one, uh, chocolate hazelnut. Yuck. That one got a 4.8. The next, this toffee. Okay, that also got a 4.8. It didn't taste like toffee. I was so excited about this one because I love toffee. <coughs> didn't taste like coffee. It tasted like coffee, like coffee ice cream. That's what it tasted like. I hate coffee ice cream. Okay. Now we're getting to better ones. This is dark chocolate. And Tommy gave this one an eight. I gave it a four, but it had an average of 5.5. So we're getting definitely getting better. Now we're moving on to the really good stuff here. Double stuffed Oreos. Double stuffed. Now that's a cookie. That one got a seven. For some reason, Tommy was voting very hard. And he thought if he liked something, he only gave it a five or a six. I don't know why. If I like something, I gave it an eight or a nine. But this one, the double stuff, had an average of seven. So we're moving up there. 
And these are new, and I wasn't so sure I was gonna like these. They're vanilla cookies, and they're lemon-flavored filling, and they don't taste anything like an Oreo. They don't look like an Oreo. They're really good. They're really, really good. And so that one got a seven out of three. Oh, a 7.3, sorry. And then these I really like. These are the mint Oreos. Oh, see how cool that is? You can't see the green? Oh, wow, that's cool. The green on the uh, over here, because of the green screen, you can't see the green. But these are mint Oreos, and yes, the filling is green. And yes, they are fabulous. And that got a 7.7. .7. I gave it a nine. And then last but not least, the Mega Stuff Oreos. I really like these. The only ones I like better are ones called the Most Stuff, which I've only found once. But these are really good. And these got the best score. And I have to say, they're kind of irresistible. And they got an 8.5 out of 10. So for those of you who are interested in Oreo cookies, there are probably at least 10 other kinds that we didn't try, but we did have a good time doing that. And I just thought it was something fun to share with you guys. So, okay. So we have done that. All right. What are we going to, what shall we do next? How about we go to trees being interesting? Cause there are a lot of interesting trees. Okay. I showed you the Deodar cedar last week and that great little picture of Kusa Dogwood helping me pick it out. But it was suggested that I do a pup date to, uh, and show how big the tree has gotten since um, we put it in the ground. And it has definitely grown <laughs> significantly. So, um, but I also wanted to show you, I thought this was pretty cool. Uh, last week I showed you what it looked like before we pruned it and how it was really skinny on top and really wide at the bottom and it needed to be staked. And so we pruned it. So. That's what it looked like. The picture on the left is what we looked like before we pruned it. The picture in the middle is after we pruned it. And that was in July. And it ha definitely has a better shape. It doesn't look quite so weird with a big pear-shaped bottom and a skinny top. So it's a little better after the pruning and we're able to pull the stake out and it has a nice leader. But August 15th, I took this other picture. Look at that. It looks like a real tree. Just between July and August, with the pruning at the bottom, which was done, you know, inside, taking branches from the center. So the bottom didn't really get any wider, but the top began to fill in. And if you can compare the tippy top to the fence behind it, it's grown almost a whole nother foot above. And it's starting to have a really nice shape. So, um, only, I was not even aware of this until I looked at the pictures and I was like, look at this, it really shows. So uh, as a result of a, a good selective pruning and it's already showing signs of significant improvement. So, but there are other things. This is my Susan Magnolia and there's a whole series of Magnolias out there um, that are part they're all named after girls and uh, there's jane there's Anne, there's susan um there's betty i had betty at blooming acres and i tried to get another betty but i was not able to but we found susan which was great because i had a dear friend named susan and it's kind of planted in her honor and you can see the it's a nice tree and it has beautiful flowers and those buds okay Here's a comparison, the same picture of that tree in the spring when it was blooming and a picture taken right now. This tree has also doubled in size and it's been in the ground for years. I did have to move it at one point, you know, maybe three years ago I had to move it, which was a little upsetting and it kind of set it back, but it's just kind of inched along until now. It's just like doubled in size and you can see how big it is. But here's the weird thing. That flower bud on the right is now. I don't know why it's producing flowers in the summer. The uh, Southern Magnolia, of which we have one of those, uh, a hardy version of the Southern Magnolia, is uh, the, the Southern Magnolia produces flowers, white flowers all summer. But this is a spring bloomer. I'm not exactly sure why it's producing a significant number, probably 15 flower buds at this time of year, but it is. And it's 
clearly way bigger than it was last year. So I'm very pleased with how that one's doing. This is a crepe myrtle, a shrub form of a crepe myrtle. I wish I remembered the variety name. I don't, but it's got that dark, dark, dark burgundy foliage and those flower buds, they just look like candy. I just, I, I mean, I'm, you, you don't eat them, but they're, they're very tempting. They're very beautiful. And, uh, that's the flowers when they open and they have almost a papery consistency to them. And um, it, it's my favorite one. I, I have three large crepe myrtles tree size. They're quite enormous. They came multi-trunked and they're, they're trees. There's no question. There's a white one, kind of a lavendery one and a, and a, a deeper pink one. And they're beautiful, but I really wanted a red one. Now I, this is the first time this has bloomed for me. I really bought it for the foliage. I didn't know what color it was going to bloom and it's absolutely gorgeous. I'm thrilled with that. So, okay. So, um, I should give the phone number again. So let's, uh, let's do that. It's, um, the, it's in the lower corner of your viewing screen and it's 1-888-399-PEGI, P-E-G-I. Can we uh, go back to me and get rid of this uh, goodbye, Crate Myrtle? And yes, so it's 888-399-7344. That's uh, Peggy, P-E-G-I, 7344. All right, so um, I do we have any callers? We have no callers. So again, let me give the phone number, 888-399-7344. All right. Well, that'll give us an opportunity. Let's go. I want to talk about lilies. You know, lilies are a wonderful plant um, and they come in a variety of sizes and they bloom at different times of the season. And we're, uh, we're going to go to the lily slideshow right now. Yes. No. Okay, and we I, do we have a caller? We have a caller also, so we'll get to them in just a second. But we're going to talk a little bit about lilies, if we can find the lily slides. Okay, there we go. Okay, let's uh, talk about them. We're going to start with this magnificent lily, which is called a tree lily. And I planted that last year. You can see in the picture on the right how big it was last year. And this is how big it was this year. Next. It's just amazing. It can reach eight to 10 feet. Now this year it reached about six feet. So I'm hoping that next year it will get um, even taller. Uh, I have four of them. They weren't, two were that big, two were much smaller. It's right outside my back door. And the wonderful thing is you stepped off the back steps and the scent the fragrance just knocked you on your feet, off your feet. It was so beautiful and just really, really lovely. So we were very, very pleased with that. And um, this is an Asiatic lily. It's one of the earlier lilies to bloom, kind of generally blooms in June. There's a smaller lily and uh, you can often find them in containers ready to go. And uh, we'll move along here. Uh, that's another one. They come back pretty reliably every year. Uh, they're kind of fun. Should we uh, take a little break on this and go to the phones? Because we do have a caller. I don't want to keep Chris waiting, waiting through all of this. So we have on the on the line is Chris from Scotch Plains. Hey, Chris, how are you doing today? Good morning, Peggy. Good, Good. to speak with you. My pleasure. Um, Peggy, I have a question about fall vegetable gardening. I've been looking online a lot, and they uh, talk about planting at different times, waiting for the heat to pass. I just wanted to know, is this a good time uh, to plant some fall vegetables? I have some uh, seedling uh, uh, broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower that I started. I haven't really put them out yet. Uh, also, I have a bunch of seeds for uh, beets and uh, chard and carrots. I don't know if it's uh, too late, too early. It's no, I think it's a good time. Now. Uh, um, I, oh, good, good. Yeah, I planted peas a couple of weeks ago, and um, they're they're up. Um, I'm hoping to get a fall crop. They take a little bit longer, 
you know, peas take a while. Um, I think if you have broccoli and cauliflower or cabbage family transplants, you could get them in the ground now, that that would be good. Um, I, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's been a definite shift in the weather. It's still really hot during the day, mm -hmm. but um, it's this morning, it was quite cool and the nights are cool. You may have heard, I indulged in a very large ice cream last night, but when we went out, I stepped out of the house. I was like, I need a sweatshirt, you know? So I went in and grabbed a sweatshirt. You don't want to be cold while you're eating ice cream. So, and that was the first time that I've gone out at night. You know, it was only like seven o'clock, 7.30, and I needed a sweatshirt. So the weather's shifting. So I think that is in your favor. Um, it might not be a bad idea to, you know, make sure that you move the plants out into blazing sun very gradually. So harden them off kind of carefully mm. before you stick them in the ground. But I think, I think you're good. I think now's the time. Okay. That, that sounds encouraging. I have my work cut out for me. And then along with that, I always hear you talk about fall is for planting. So I do have some containerized uh, shrubs and young trees that need to be planted at some point. Would you advise holding off on planting them for another couple of weeks, a couple of months, or since the weather is cool, do you think I could uh, reasonably get them in the ground as well? Well, as I said earlier, um, my jujube tree arrived, and I am planning mm -hmm. on getting it in the ground on Thursday, which is my birthday. And that's I'll take this. So that is August 24th. It's already the end of August. It's, you know, it's getting there. Again, you don't want to put anything from a shady location into a sunny location without giving it the chance to make sure that it's acclimated so that it doesn't get burned. Um, you can wait until, you know, Labor Day weekend. That's a good time. Uh, Any time in September is acceptable. One of the things that you want to keep in mind is that root growth kind of stops, root development kind of stops when ground temperatures go below 45 degrees. You don't really get much root development. And one of the things that you really mm -hmm. want to make sure of is that you have root development going into the winter. That's kind of important that you have root mm -hmm. development going into the winter. So um, if you plant too late, then things can be pushed right out of the ground because they haven't, you know, sent out any roots to keep them firmly in the ground then so you, you you don't want that to happen so you know okay you want to kind of if you can do it soon um i would do it you know within the next few weeks um today would probably okay. be okay but you don't want to wait too long okay that sounds good thank you i appreciate it and happy birthday oh thank you i still you know and the number's getting quite large but i still really like my birthday <laughs> I can't help it. it okay. a, when, when, when was the big day? What day was your birthday? It's coming. It's Thursday. So that's the day I'm going to plant my oh, tree. Oh, okay. So it's coming up. So I'm oh, very okay, very good. So I, I missed the first few minutes of your show. Okay, I appreciate it. All right, Chris. Well, it's always a pleasure. Yeah. All right, so you have a, a great Thank day. You. And let me know how everything works out, okay? I'll keep you posted. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye now. now. All right, so let's finish up the lilies. And uh, because we're an hour is almost up already. So, um, so these are also Asiatic lilies. And I just, I was one of those honey, stop the car moments where I made him stop the car and I hopped out and I took pictures of these lilies that were growing uh, up against a less than beautiful chain link fence and just drew the eye. They were so gorgeous. Uh, mass planting in that brilliant yellow was just really show stopping. And, uh, that's an old picture, but I couldn't resist showing you that is that was in a container. That was a lily grown in a container at a nursery. And I just had to take that pretty little butterflies picture in that lily. So they do draw pollinators, which is good. So these are oriental lilies and they bloom later. So sort of... Um, they're very, very fragrant. The flowers are more open, more star-like, um, but they're, they are later season lilies. So, um, and kind of, yeah. And that was one, again, that was in a container. I took that at a nursery. That's a double. That is a beautiful, beautiful lily. Um, so there's all different kinds. This was another stop the car kind of thing. I think I was, I was alone when I took this, but uh, they do, they are very dramatic. They are very colorful. They last for years. The bulbs are kind of pricey, but they do last, which is a, a big advantage. 
These are Easter lilies, and most people are not aware that Easter lilies are hardy around here, um, but they will not bloom at Easter. They bloom in July. So they kind of are in between the Asiatics and the Orientals. They bloom in July. But uh, anybody that is affiliated with a church that's throwing away a bunch of Easter lilies after Easter lily season in the spring, grab them because you can stick them in the ground and they will come back and they will be quite dramatic in uh, mid to late July. These are called tiger lilies, and they are often confused with the day lilies that are called tiger lilies, but day lilies and tiger lilies, uh, day lilies are not really tiger lilies. These are tiger lilies. And um, one of the things that I really find pretty fascinating about these is that the tiger lilies have bulbils, B-U-L-B-I-L-S. And you can see those tiny little bead-like things in the where the leaves attach to the stem. And each one of those can be removed and you can start them as a new plant. Now, one of the things that's important is you need to leave them on there until they fully mature. So you don't want to harvest them until the late August or early September. So pretty soon now, you kind of walk a fine line because they are shed. So you don't want to wait until they've all dropped off because you won't find them. But they, um, they can be propagated. It's asexual propagation. They're not seeds. And they're kind of um, amazing that you can get as many, so many plants from just plucking off those little bulbils. Does that wrap that up? So that's good. Okay. Well, I have something else that I really need to say. And um, uh, many of you have heard me mention um, a dear friend of mine, Uncle Ed, who has listened to my show on WCTC from its inception, which was like almost 35 years ago. He was also, we, um, he was the first, the second person to call and wish me well when we went to WOLD and we had a very nice conversation. And last year in June, he celebrated his 100th birthday. And this year in June, he celebrated his 101st birthday. Um, there was supposed to be a party, but then that didn't happen. And unfortunately, yesterday, Uncle Ed has passed. But I have to say a couple things. Um, he is the last person in my parents' generation in my family. And he was always there for me. I mean, in, not that we were super close or I saw him a lot, but I always knew he was listening. And he always made me feel like whenever I did have a chat with him, that I was doing a good job. And I don't know, I don't think you can ever get too old where you don't appreciate a pat on the back from a parent type figure. And he always made me feel good. And, and he always made me laugh. And he was always kind. And he was just the most faithful of listeners. And, uh, and now, now he's gone. And of course, uh, we can't really argue too much that he lived to be 101. Um, and it was, the end is never great, but his was as good as it could be, all things considered. And I have a quote from him that I will share with you. That Uncle Ed said that the last year wasn't so hot, but the first hundred were great. And so I think that's a pretty amazing outlook. And we should all be so fortunate to have that kind of life. And we should all be so fortunate to have somebody like Uncle Ed in their life. So wherever you are, Uncle Ed, I hope we will see you again, and I will be here next week, same time, same place, and I hope wherever you are, you are still listening. So until then, Uncle Ed and all my other listeners, have a good one. Bye-bye.